Take a load off and relax now Cause we're drinking right. with Ronson After too long Sort of Has We talk all the time this Hmm and we really need to just vocalize it, man. Because, like, sometimes we're typing just, like, you know, at 2 a.m., just typing, typing, typing. But Yeah, yeah we're always, like, because we're always, you and I are both, we both keep an eye on kind of what the industry is doing and the lunacy that is. Um, and I know that you're also, you know, kind of well-known for going well behind the uh, just, the is curtain. the game fun? You you, you dive into uh, some standards and whatnot. Which, by the way, I liked your, uh, I liked your licensing vid. Thanks, man. I mean, what, what do you think about that? We can start there on that topic because, I mean, it's true, right? Like, if a company that has IP wants to actually, you know, stick around for a while with a new TCG, wouldn't they do a joint venture to, like, say, okay, this is a new entity? When they so have a licensing I, agreement, it's kind of like a uh, pull out any time. I can't entirely say I agree with that aspect of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, no, a part, I, that's, that's a part I, that's a part I don't quite just because there's so many angles that you can go with that, um, yeah. it could just be it could be an absolute mess. And then you get really fuzzy into what do you call a trading card game? Um, like I wouldn't want to lock myself with a specific publisher for something that is. I've got a I've got a Star Wars game like fan you know like what FFG has, but also I got like I'm also licensing to Munchkin. Who oh, yeah. has, you know? Let's just say that I have that. Who also has you know booster packs of sorts. Um, yeah, it's just elements of legal and stuff like that. But I mean, I don't know. If nobody's, I haven't seen anybody try it, so twist my arm to see somebody try it. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I, we're seeing a couple games come out recently with a license IP, and when I saw Star Wars Unlimited, I thought I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. But then I saw, oh, this is Fantasy Flight Games. And it's just like, what is this? Like, <laughs> Star Wars 2 Electric Boogaloo? Like... It seems like it's going to be the same trajectory. You come out strong, a year or two goes by, and then yeah, um, eventually, some, eventually something gets pulled the plug. I'm I'm a little bit more optimistic about this one because because this one's a trading card game. You know, part of the challenges with things like Netrunner and Legend of the Five Rings and all those is that it's also a different business model that hasn't really been proven. Um, and Lord knows they got close, but they didn't quite execute too too well on on the LCG thing. So that's probably why they backed off and then of course there's destiny but destiny is just such a wildly different game mm -hmm. um that that might have been a little bit hard for them to you know grab that audience like i'm playing a dice game i'm a full and play dice game um so maybe like i'm a little i'm a little bit more optimistic on this one um but we'll see i don't know the kinds of things that like make them drop a product because this isn't going to explode like crazy it's you know they're not going to it's not going to lorcana um it's going to tap into an audience that is maybe Star Wars doubt already. You might get lucky and have another show like Ahsoka, which I haven't watched yet, but you might have another show that comes out that gets people really jazzed about Star Wars. But you'll also have everybody who's just watched Star Wars games just suck for years or just be great and get pulled because that's the FFG way. Yeah. That sucks though. Cause, the... God, because Star Wars Limited is such what a phenomenal game. Is it a good game? No, I haven't but... played it yet. Mm hmm The mechanics who made are... the game. Huh? Who uh developed the game? I don't remember. Some guy. Oh, some I guy. Don't, I don't... I'm not great with those kinds of details. <laughs> I'm not a name dropping detail person. <laughs> um But the basic premise, it's very, very back and forth. It's alternating actions, which I love. I need more games need to do alternating actions. Similar to like how Genesis was alternating actions. You had rounds mm. and then you had alternating actions back and forth. Um, those games are great. So the idea is you you both pick a you both pick a leader and a base. Between mm -hmm. the icons that your leader represents as well as the icon your base represents, that gives you for the most part your deck building restrictions. Um, and you can actually you can venture into anything. But the goal is to destroy destroy the opponent's base. That's it. Similar to like a Lorcana where you can slow down the opponent's board or you know like a key forge also where you can slow down the opponent's board or you can just push towards the win condition star wars is no different um and there's star wars, lanes i think right yeah where yeah where star wars changes the game a little bit and excels quite a bit is they have a ground and a space battlefield hmm. that both things exist on so you can lean really heavy in ground and just get raffle stomped by space and vice versa 
see there's a there's a heck of a lot of value in balancing um and then having the having the alternating actions um there's a lot of timing there's a lot of you know what do i do when who's open who's vulnerable and you've got one last mechanic that's brilliant which is the ability to take initiative hmm. so you know somebody starts the game round one one of the actions that you can take is you can take initiative so that way you go first next round but in doing so you end your actions the opponent gets to just do anything and everything they want oh that's the same as star wars destiny Okay, yeah, if, I didn't do too much Star Wars Destiny. So if it, if oh, it's yeah, that yeah. yeah, so if it's that mechanic, then that's a mechanic, and it's there's a battlefield in Star Wars Destiny, and like it's like the field of play, and it has like some like thing on it, and you can choose to take it, and then next round you get like a buff based on what that is. Yeah, in this case, all it is is you get to go first. Um, that's gotcha. It. But and you you can't take any actions after you take that, which is the same as Destiny. Yeah, yep. yeah. I, I hope it does good. I mean. Overall, it's great to see when new games come out, but it's just the the licensing thing in the past just seemed really strange because I think it was one of the games, Destiny or um, Netrunner, where they had like this huge tournament, the, the game was booming, everything was doing great. I think it was for both games, and then all of a sudden just poof. Like, yeah. they're like, we're going to stop doing this. And maybe there was other things in the background that people weren't aware of where it wasn't profitable anymore, but... It's so just the Netrunner thing that. was the Netrunner thing was one hundred percent bad timing and bad luck because of success. It's that's basically what happened. So you, I forgot who owned what of the two, but FFG owned. I think FFG owned. Android. I think they owned both. No, 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 they did not own both. They didn't. FFG owned Android, the Android universe. Mm -hmm. Um. Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast? I think it was Wizards. Wizards owned Netrunner. Oh, you're talking about it. Oh, yeah, that's that's correct. So yep. FFG licensed Netrunner for I think six years. They had they licensed Netrunner from Wizards of the Coast for six years with the possibility of renewing at the six year mark. The problem oh. is that within that time, FFG gets bought by Asmodee. Wizards gets bought by uh, gets bought by Hasbro. So you got these two huge competitors. No way are you going to have this cross collaboration <laughs> uh, contract all of a sudden happen, um, yeah, which sucks I, because the Netrunner. You know, the, I think that the Netrunner IP was it, it was it expired in twenty sixteen. It's up for grabs. It's crazy. The game was really good too. I oh. never played it, but I've seen so many good gameplay videos, and it's just I love the one where the Netrunner the runners going and like doing a run against a thing, and they don't know if it's a trap card or if it's the you know objective goal and just seeing those like mind games oh. you can play and it's so i've good. got i've got so many fun memories of the mind games that you can play with netrunner um <laughs> and the word just just turtle games where like i got three things i can put down i'm just gonna shuffle them up and lay them out they are open you are welcome to take any of them <laughs> i don't know what they are i'm take not gonna card any card it could be <laughs> yeah, any i can't tell you um <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I like, and Netrunner had a really great thing for that, and that's not something that other games can really do, where one side has all the information. You know, it was it was uh, as not asymmetrical, but one side has all the information and the other side doesn't. Um, that was what made Netrunner so good. Um, and that's when I think the I'd flavor like to too, right? Like the flavor of I am a runner, I am hacking into a corporation, I mm -hmm. can hack into a bunch of different systems that they have, and yep, you I'm, build I'm, your. I'm, exposing your agendas as the uh, yeah. you know, so the corporation you were you were completing and satisfying those agendas as the runner i am exposing those agendas for the terrible corporation that you are um and i would hack into servers and the runner's job is to hack into servers before the corporation could actually satisfy their objectives however the corporation had to take some risks in how fast and how well they satisfied those objectives because they could leave the door wide open for the runner to be able to just expose them. So that's when you get into, you know, protecting servers and, you know, ice and yeah. how much time does the you know, how looking at the runner, looking what they have, their board state and saying how much time do you actually need right now to get into to get into this thing I'm trying to protect? Can I sneak something in or maybe I can bluff this? Ah. Ah. And just I feel like I a lot of games out there don't they don't really encapsulate that flavor yet. And the corporation's doing all these things and like you feel like it's doing those things. You feel like the corporation or you feel like the runner. 
A lot of games yeah. I feel like don't like you don't know who you are in the sense like I'm just a wizard. Just yeah, I am magic. Stuff. I am I am all the things, and I just I plunk it down. That's one of the main things that it's one of the things that makes Netrunner as fun as it does, uh, or not Netrunner. Bleh. One of yeah. the things that makes Flesh and Blood uh, as fun as it is, especially Agreed. with something like Bright Lights, where I feel like Teklavasen trying to put on Ultron suit. I feel like Dash, who is now upgraded from inventing. Uh, items to manifesting them Star Trek computer style because um, that's basically who she is uh, and I, I feel like uh, I feel like Max who's got basically a little bit of anarchy in him but I've got a bunch of batteries I've got <laughs> I am I am siphoning all this power from you know from these systems that maybe I shouldn't have access to um yeah, of course. Flesh uh, being, and Blood is really good with flavor. like that character, have that kind of flavor, that stuff's just so cool. It's one of the things I really would like to see Fab do more in future sets. Um, of just feeling like you're that character and that iteration of that class trying to execute that thing, that, that interesting thing. Yeah, because Ranger probably has one of the most thematic ones of all the classes. Mm -hmm. You have to load the arrow first, like you have to draw the arrow and then you shoot. You can't just shoot the arrow. You gotta load it, drop, you know, and then shoot. I'd like to see more exploration in Ranger a little bit because I don't, I don't. Their flavor is a restriction. Their flavor makes things harder. That's um, true. Where that's not entirely the case with everybody else. Um, semi with Dash, kind of, sort of, but the difference is that Dash gets to keep her stuff, and I don't, um, <laughs> as the Ranger. Riptide, and again, that's kind of why I really liked Riptide. Was Riptide was really close, and that's why that's why in, uh, Invigorating Shot is just so perfect. Of it's it's creating that risk and reward. It's knowing that Ranger is vulnerable, but Ranger is vulnerable all the time because they're primarily set up to kind of sucker sucker you into where they want you, which mm -hmm. Azalea couldn't could never really do. Because her whole thing was just getting her arrows where she wanted them. Riptide is, I want to get you where I want you. I want to get Very you true. to play that action. I want to get you to, you know, I want to give you go again. I want to give you plus one. I want to give you everything you can to think that you're safe. I want to give you that false sense of security and power. Oh, Riptide's so perfect. He's so perfect, flavor-wise. Yeah, and it's definitely a different, like, version of the class. Because with Azalea, you're trying to go very tall... You know, Lexi, you're going wide, Riptide, you have a bunch of traps you're laying out, and you're waiting for them to come to you, so it's completely different. Yeah, I I want you to do, I need you to do like 10 to 12 damage to yourself. I'll, I'll see you on the other side of some chip shots. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually, eventually, you know, they become a liability to themselves, which I think is the thing I love about Riptide is, yeah, I can, you know, whatever, I can let this arrow in, whatever, you know, two damage, three damage, four damage, who cares? And then suddenly you're at 10 life, eight life and you're like i don't know if i can attack anymore is my problem <laughs> and riptide is <laughs> just like yeah yeah about that that's mm -hmm. so true so mm. i heard i don't i don't want to forget bringing this up uh there's a tournament coming up called the uh coaxing there's an a event coming up uh, called the coaxing do you know anything about that at all. Um, it's done by some asshole who has some he's you know he's just some content creator who's trying to uh, trying to make himself look relevant Oh, the uh, balls on that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. I hope his channel ends at the end of the year. Um, <laughs> Foreshadow. <laughs> ow, ow, plot twist. Um, Shamlin style. Um, anyway, so uh, so the coaxing. Um, third year for the coaxing. Actually, well, let's just let's get the baseline out. Uh, the coaxing is a brewery takeover uh, of hmm. Left Hand Brewery out here in what was what was Longmont, but now they have a second location down in downtown Denver. We are upgrading from our 400 square foot mill room and whatever barrels people can stick a play mat on. There are pictures. They are amazing. Um, That's they were awesome. Perseverance. It's just it's a it's just a play mat, just long ways on a table, and just both sides are, you know, you've got you've got the oh, square two barrels. No, one barrel. It's one, one barrel, barrel one one, one barrel, wow. one play mat. You've got like the square equipment configuration, and everything else is just like hanging on this. It's it's a mess. I feel bad for them, but like they made it work. But anyway, we've upgraded from 400 square foot mill room and barrels to a 10,000 square foot. We get the whole building, and they're opening it up for us on a day they're not open normally. Wow. Um, they've they've loved this event so much that one, we are a permanent fixture on uh, their wall in. 
um, in Longmont, which is their main location. Um, mm -hmm. So th we did a we did a guest book, um, and it's it's hanging on their wall, right, so right, right across from the room that we were all playing at. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they want to do they want to do a lot more with this it's this year, thus thus giving us their beautiful and massive location um we get to do like custom we get to do custom drink menus and and uh we get to we really just deck this thing out it's gonna be really cool i have banners i got banners that sounds so um, cool are you gonna play around the table there yeah so the, the way that this works um the last couple of years i've tried to center the event or i've tried to center the coaxing around like a single event that has been mm -hmm. a mistake both times um year one was not nearly as bad because it was just an armory year two is a skirmish and i will never do that again Mm -hmm. um what a dumb idea um hey primarily... you live and you learn right exactly thankfully i'm a lot harder on myself than than anybody else is so a lot of people just loved it but the problem with the skirmish in an official tournament is that you're tra trapped in rounds integrity you're also trapped in that people will stick around for lighter uh for later rounds even if they're just getting their butt whooped so they can try mm -hmm. to get a little experience so I'd have people who were like, oh, and five at, at 6 p.m. when, you know, I've got two and a half hours left, three hours left. They're like, we're just going to hang the skirmish and I don't want to participate in anything else because I want the XP. Like, oh, mm, that felt really <laughs> bad. So we won't be doing that again. Instead, what we have is we've got um, side by side tournaments. We're starting the morning with a Living Legends format. Um, mm -hmm. And then early afternoon, early to mid afternoon, we're going to kick off a uh, um, Bright Lights Team Sealed uh, tournament. Mm. So That's that way cool. if you don't want to do you know if living legends is kicking your butt hey you know make up team and uh, join me for some team sealed it's blitz look faster it was originally team 3v3 cc but timing just did not let that work um well especially yeah. when you have teams and you have to have three on three like and you have to make sure all those people come together that's it sounds hard to coordinate from the the player's point of view well i mean that's on them like yeah. the coaxing tries to be a big enough spectacle that it is worth coming out and there's always ways hey i need another teammate something like that the trick though is that the reason i wanted to do the team format is one it's camaraderie and fun but two it's also a cheeky way to reduce my round count because mm -hmm. my players reduces by two-thirds effectively oh that's true um so I was that I tr that was kind of my my pathway to solve the time issue. But I got sold on Living Legend in the Morning Team Sealed. But on top of those two events, there's a bunch of different side pods that are happening. Um, so if you want to just hang out, you don't want to be a part of any of those, or you you bow you owe to Living Legend, you're like I'm just gonna wait. Um, you can pay pretty much any other format under the sun. Uh, UPF Blitz CC. I've got a uh, a Pied Piper format. I'm bringing out. Um, which is a variation of uh, UPF proper. Um, I'm probably I might do some crack shuffle play. I'm still I need to go negotiate that with the store I'm partnering with. Mm -hmm. um, some some uh, CSP tournaments, uh, and I'll have around the table out uh, as well. But the goal with this That's one awesome. is that it's not just for people who want to play in some massive tournaments. Um, this is going to be prize wall. It's going to be very similar to like coaxing and calling. Um, except you pay in advance and you're not paying per event anymore. Um, unless of course it's like CSP or, or team sealed or something <laughs> like that. Um, but yeah, so there's stuff to earn, there's stuff to do. I'm trying to expand be out beyond just things that are card game specific. So we've got, uh, we have Deb who, if you've ever been on, uh, on Twitter and see the, uh, the fab doodles. Um, oh, I'm not on Twitter too much. But she does like doodles and stuff. Yeah, you've like, probably if you've been watching any of the Battle Hardens also, sometimes you see doodles of event names and you try to guess what the event name is. Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen those. So that's Deb, uh, who is uh, who's a Colorado girl, um, who does those. So she's out. Um, she's out there. So we've we got some fun little activities with that. Uh, making her a coffee table book also, um, called Deb's Fab Farmery. I'm really proud of the name. <laughs> oh nice. I'm really, I'm really proud of the name. Um, so stuff like that. Uh, I was inspired by my baby shower. Um, so my wife, uh, in researching our baby shower, like if you've ever gone to a baby shower, that's just typical. Like it sucks. It's like, let's get in a, let's get in a circle and play games that just make you humiliate yourself and hate yourself. <laughs> um, but she found that on like Etsy, there's these cool, just like little like quarter sheet, like word jumbles and, and who knows mommy best, who knows daddy best. Like these, these fun little games that you just take pieces of paper and just vibe and hang with people and just fill them out. And eventually you just like, Hey, we're going to call out answers for these and we have prizes for winners and it was a lot more casual a lot more fun so i want to do stuff like that um that sounds cool and, and basically it's it's just uh there's 
archaic type of like you know uh games that people normally play but this was yeah. more of like a more yeah, like of if a, you're, if you're hanging one out, night werewolf yeah you're uh, not even, honestly i don't need to be i don't need people to get together really it's there are more activities than anything but you know there's there's answers um it's so it's like hey uh, it's like hey i'm in between rounds i'm nursing a beer you know i'm just i'm just chatting and hey i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this uh this little activity thing this little fab like lore trivia thing um and or or you know one of the other many that i have and that earns you stuff so i'm trying to find opportunities outside of i'm here to play the game to enjoy the world of flesh and blood um I like that. That's smart. It's kind of like what a normal uh, event of Flesh and Blood does too, right? Like, because you go to these callings or national tournaments, and of course you have the 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 main event. You have side games, but you also have artists signing stuff, mm -hmm. and you know the cosplay. You have a bunch of different things. So even if you're not doing the main thing, you you're still doing something that is yeah. fun and it's part of the you know game spirit. I mean, yeah. I, I remember the last time I went. To, uh, I think I went to uh, San Jose. And I, I literally, I played maybe three games of Flesh and Blood the whole time. I was just talking to people, having fun, and just, you know, there's a bunch of other things to do other than just playing the game. Yeah, so I want to try to tap into that a little bit. Um, the coaxing has always been a grand experience or experiment in trying to bring the casual and competitive community together um, in a way where they both get to enjoy games, they get to enjoy things how they would want, um, without mm -hmm. having to sacrifice either respective experience. Um... That's something I think Team does really well. That's why this year we're doing Living Legend. I know like a lot of our CC guys are really excited to try out the Dust Blade for the first time. <laughs> um, so like you know the CC the CC guys get in. There's a ton of little events and stuff for like, hey, I just want something casual. I just got my butt whooped. I just want to have something that's goofy and silly. I'm gonna get a crack shuffle play and not think that it's my deck building skills that are the problem. I want to I want to go blame packs for my bad performance for a little bit. <laughs> um, and then same on the other side of, you know, having the casual guys, you know, be able to enjoy something that's just casual and fun. That is that they're still, you know, earning and acquiring something for just being there. But the, the most important thing that changes is the mood. Mm. Um, this is one of the things that I've done. Uh, we did a judges conference and I talked about the challenges of community building. And I don't think it's talked about often enough when you have a casual versus competitive of just playing around with formats that doesn't work and it doesn't work for a reason which is because the vibe that people have coming in the mood that people have when they show up to an event of i want to play i'm testing let's go if you're in an event space or competitive space you don't really care to like download and dissect and debrief with some newbie who's just like what are you doing <laughs> um and usually and on, on the other flip side of that sometimes those casual guys who are just learning they know that you know i just got my ass kicked i'm not even worthy i am not worthy of you um <laughs> if i you know if i don't know you so i'm trying to peel about peel away those lay those layers that limit the experience by the expectations set by those two communities i want to see if i can pull it off so far i'm two for two um it's just now perfecting my own execution so everybody feels like they had i i feel like everybody <laughs> had a great experience everybody's telling I mean, me that i'm like i choose to disbelieve the whole beer scenario too seems to lighten the mood as well. I I think that that is a really secret sauce. I'm surprised there aren't other events that incorporate that to a larger degree. Like, hey, this is a brewery, and then part of the brewery has a you know side room that holds like a hundred people, and you can drink and play cards and have fun because you know, like you're saying, you know, Flesh and Blood is a very competitive game in its nature. I mean, if you think about it, first thing you have to do create a deck. Well, when you create your deck, you're like. What cards can I put by deck that give me the highest chances of winning? When right. you sit down with players, you're like, oh, I have to sideboard. What cards do I take out versus their thing? And then when you play cards, you're like, okay, what is my strategy long term? And what cards should I play in certain orders win? Like everything's right. about how do I beat my opponent instead of like, how do I just play yeah. a game of flat, play a game and have fun and meet a new person? Yeah, you really so need to right you, you bring up a good point. Yeah, you need the right brewery for it because one, you run into liability. You run into people who are concerned that alcohol plus cards equals ruined cards. Um, three, especially Com comes... commoner. Yeah. Again, and that that comes into well, I don't really want to play commoner. I want to try my CC deck. Yeah. Um, and they're just they don't care. Um, that also leads into making sure, especially for bigger events, that the brewery is family friendly. 
that there are mm-hmm. options for, you know, if you're going to do something for a long period of time, that there are options for food, uh, which thank God this one has a full kitchen. Oh my God, this has a full kitchen. I am so thankful. Um, it's like four or five staff. It's not a food truck that will never, ever hit. They will never get the food out on time for the number of people <laughs> who are sending. Um, so there's a lot of little logistic things that can really screw up the experience quite a bit. One of the things that we've been doing, there's there's also the the fact that it's in a competition, the fact that even just walking in with the idea of I'm going to try to win, it, that screws half the people who are there. Mm-hmm. It, just, it just does. And regardless of whether, you know, they could tell you, no, I'm just, I'm here to have fun, but I'm probably going to win because um, I'm just, I'm good. But even that still creates that feeling of like, I don't feel like I'm worried to just like shoot the shit with you. Maybe I'll, I'll hang over a game um, and I'll feel weird about it. Um, so one of the ways that we've been countering it out here in Colorado is we've been taking and kind of treat this as you will, because of course the counter's like, well, LGSs aren't getting their money for things. End of the day, if I don't want to go to an LGS for an armory because they're playing Blitz, I don't really lose anything here anyway. Um, we've been doing testing parties. Hmm. So we'll go to it. We'll be like, hey, you know, instead of having an event that is tied to prize support that you're paying anything for, that's that's any of those things. Instead of instead of wrapping around, you got to wait for everybody to finish. We're doing. We will do it. We're going to go to the left hand. We're going to go to X Brew, and we're going to do a testing party. Anybody who wants to show up, just show up. What's that? Uh, I've got Worlds in November. I know who's. We got a couple people who are going to Worlds, and we want to help you guys test. No events. No none of that. It's just come on out, bring bring the stuff you want to test. If you want to say, hey, I'd love to test against this, I'm sure people can like build a deck or if people are, you know, however it is, just bring your deck and go. And the nice thing is that, that I want to try to get better, but I don't feel I'm worthy of your time is something that's enhanced in this experience because in talking about your lines, because of talking about how you play the deck, you're kind of refining and sharpening your own skills as opposed to mm. you're wasting my time. <laughs> um... And then when you add, not even just alcohol, but when you just, when you add that kind of bar vibe and that camaraderie vibe, as well as the comfort of knowing that if I lose this one or I, I, I just can scoop it, um, and try it again, I'm not sitting waiting for 20, 30 minutes. I can just kind of jump in that, that tones sense. down a lot of that, that kind of weird, unanticipated pressure, um, to, yeah, if like, one person knows they're gonna lose, they can just be like, "Hey, I scoop. Yeah, like, let's, you know, you, let's you, run you, it back." Yeah, you got this one. Can we run it back? Um, stuff like that. So, I love testing parties. I you know you can you can also screw around. Like my joke with testing parties was I was going to, I was going to order pizza, but I was going to ask the pizza shop specifically to make all of the pizzas like off center on the crust <laughs> and call it the Monarch First Pizza. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I could do I could do it I could I could make the experience fun and silly. I wanted to have like a plate of ice, just a plate of ice and just call it the ice meta because it's boring <laughs> and it just gets worse the longer it sits there. <laughs> it becomes more liability. <laughs> um so yeah, you could you just you know, play around with ideas and just just that kind of stuff. Like take take the competition out of it and you can bring those two communities together really well. The coaxing tries to do that. <laughs> Um, that seems like a really nice endeavor because, uh, I think the big thing that will eventually make it so people can play flesh and blood in a more casual format, I think you said this recently that I agree with is the PVE and we've, you know, everyone's been talking about it for the last three years, but you know, once you have that type of game experience where I am on a team with these three party members versus this, you know, these baddies, that's more of a camaraderie type thing, but making the competitive format game more camaraderie based or, or social is it's a little bit more difficult but when you're doing testing i i think you're right it really focuses the, the attention more of everyone's trying to learn and get better and everyone's yeah. trying to harness their skills like that's yeah. the objective versus if there's a tournament your prime goal and objective is to get first place in the tournament yeah. that like you're the, changing it from that to i want to actually learn and grow and get better so yeah that, the difference the difference cool. between a competition and a testing party and a casual and you know something like that is in a tournament i don't i i want to win and in a testing party i want to get i want to lose yeah like i want i want to see how am i going to lose so that way i know that's not going to happen for the thing i'm actually testing for um, is it flake that says uh if you're not losing you're not learning like, <laughs> there you go and it's, it's true 
Um, yeah, and it's just, it's stuff like that. So that's essentially what the coaxing is, is, you know, the experiment to pr try to bring everybody together. LSS is also, for the first time, proper helping us um with some no. really good price support they've got some really cool things that they're that they're working on that we get to, that we get to play around with um one of the things i also made very very clear is i don't want a pti um and i told i told them that like when it, they asked me like what what would you like from us i said i do not want a pti i do not want anything that takes this tournament and turns it into if everybody wants to try to win the living crap out of it because that yep. much top tier stuff that it ruins the experience for me so i'm trying to find other ways to do it i proposed a couple suggestions like you know feature on uh you know let's do a feature on fab for for the winner of it let's do like you know let's give them like a one-on-one -on -one with a member of the lss team for like an hour like winning winning team sealed gets like a one-on-one -on -one with like brian or winning of living living legend gets like a one-on-one -on -one with brian for like an hour or something like that like yeah, find that creative cool. ways to do prize support that creates really cool experiences without it doesn't always have to be money. It doesn't always have to be promos. Um, we're going to see how it goes. If anything, it's going to be really damn fun. Um, I hope it goes good, man. It sounds really cool. And it's in the beginning of December, right? December 10th. We're, I've got a couple of mixologists who are currently who are currently helping me with some recipes um, for custom. Because it's a full bar. So it's not just oh. a brewery. It's a full bar. Uh, that that location is. So I got my friend Jen. She's, uh, she's, working, on, um, she's working on Crazy Brew. Um, oh, which be like, like an actual drink that's crazy brew. I asked. I asked for a. So when you do, when you think at scale, you don't want every drink to be like a premium cocktail. The bar staff yeah. will go nuts. Um, they will lose their minds. But I did want to have one for crazy brew. That was a premium cocktail. So I want like a multi-layered thing. Um, I think it was created a long time ago uh, in New Zealand. I thought they had a bar close by and they had a, uh, a recipe for it. I could be wrong on that. I do remember that uh, Braden, who owns Fork and Brewer, made a crazy brew brew. Um, I don't know if they made like a proper drink, but either way, I've got I've got the community helping me with some of those. I've got that. I've got co a, a Coaxic Commotion. Um, That's so awesome. So that'll be fun to add some fun flair to it. Um, I mentioned like the activities and things like that. I'm testing out a Pied Piper format also, just for fun. Um, in my video about like UPF, like UPF and not having board states. I decided to come up with something that has a board state, which I call Pied Piper. Where one person is the threat, which is probably the... No? No. No. That's more like PvE, which is really more one versus many. I wanted to create the experience of a board state without changing the basic rules of the game, um, which is real hard to do. Uh, so, And I, I came up with a really crafty, silly, creative way to, way to do it. So Pied Piper format is a Yorick UPF. So it's Yorick. Mm. And I'm making custom meeps. Like okay. meep tokens and paws for weapons. All right? Cra and that sounds crazy. And we're playing, we're going to play, it, at this point, it's just Yorick UPF that's basically Chaff Goblin. That's, that's <laughs> what I've introduced so far. Here's the trick. Here's what makes it real fun. Here's where I add the board state. Mm -hmm. The decks are static. Um, okay, so they don't change. It's the same. They don't change. And when you set up for you, for Pied Piper, you're going to get a generic deck, and you'll get to randomly pick four classes, and they will all be color-coded by sleeve color. Mm -hmm. So that's my board state. So everybody at the table is, unless, until you see it, you're not going to know what class it is, but everybody's going to be able to see the class of card in people's hand, as well as what's coming. Mm. I like that. That sounds cool. So that's kind of how I got around the board state, and like everybody can react to fucking Bob, who's got four purple cards, and I know that purple means guardian. Um, we should probably deal with that. <laughs> um, you know, stuff. I think stuff like that would be. It's it's a simple way to add a everybody can react to something. Um, mm -hmm. but I think it's gonna be. I think it'll be fun. It'll, whatever. If anything, it'll be worth trying. It'll be worth just shooting the shit with. That sounds really cool, man. You'll have to let me know how it goes, and uh, mm -hmm. if there's any uh, video gameplay, that'd be cool to watch. And like, I think the the professor's uh, what is it round the table? I felt like that. It, it, I don't think it's geared too much, but I think it should just stay static, right? I can't imagine people tweaking those decks and then playing the same decks, you know, so within the group. It feels I like more of my... like a board game. 
Yeah. Um, so I asked, and that, that's kind of one of the, that's one of the nice things about the round the table is that I don't touch it. Hmm. And that shouldn't be, t that really shouldn't be. And that's kind of, that's kind of the point. One of the biggest challenges that I've had and I've seen UPF had, and I asked my community this, how many of you have played UPF? And I got a couple hands. Um, and I had, it's a semi-weighted question, but I don't think I'm too far off. How many of you have not tried UPF because you don't want to spend the time building a deck for it? Everyone's hand shot up. <laughs> um, because with UPF, like with UPF, it's either I'm going to come in to screw around, which I've got other formats for that, or I'm going to come in to try to win the thing. And if I'm going to try to try to win the thing, or if I'm worried that other people are going to try to win the thing, that means I got to rotate my CNCs. That means I got to rotate my E strikes. That means I got to find like my my UPF spice which are committed to my CC decks. And I really just don't want to go through that effort. Yeah. Um, that's why I like around the table of just like, keep it as is like, keep, keep UPF static. Maybe at some point down the road, you'll have better stuff, but I'm still in the, give me bonkers. Give me insanity. Um, make well, it, so I, I like that. make it so C and C is like so low in the power level. Um, <laughs> that it just, I just don't want it because it is a subjectively worse. It's an objectively worse card. Or UPF, give me that. No, card. I, I really like it, man. Because especially the static way, because the like we were talking earlier, when you deck create that you're when you're trying to be competitive, when you you know sideboard stuff, you're trying to be competitive. If you have everything static, then it reduces all that you know headache and also reduces that mindset of I'm trying to win. How do I win? And how do I build a deck that wins? Yeah, so, that's what I'm really hoping cool, that uh, I'm really hoping the PVE does that as well. Um, I think it's kind of the only way to do that, honestly. Just, mm. it's the only way to do that. Or everyone's K, everyone's K now and the game doesn't matter. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so uh, I, honestly, what I really hope, I really hope that they go legacy style. Like Aeon's End style mm. of, I go through a campaign and I open up things that give me new cards. Like Lexabelle, I think her name is Lexabelle the Alchemist. Um, like I hope that it's her stuff and I can buy things, but it's, I hope it's like that legacy format for PVE. Oh, we're talking about like PVE? Yeah, for PVE. I think that- like, Gotcha. I can't you think it'll be think like a rogue like product. Where you start with a base like 10 card deck and then like you go on a quest and then you open a pack, get to pick one card and put it in your deck and then you do a quest. Yeah, maybe, pack, some, maybe something your... like that. That's yeah, something, that, I mean- If, if you, you level up, then... you add a card. Yeah, if you saw the dungeon crawler that I did for Genesis, that was the form that was similar to the format that we had, where as you progress through the campaign, the party earned packs to upgrade themselves and level up by mm -hmm. getting more of a you know, getting a higher deck limit. Uh, in the case of Genesis, they had chi, so you got a higher chi value. Um mm -hmm. things like that. So I wouldn't mind seeing that. I also wouldn't mind seeing um or I would love to see a one. I please do PVE only cards for the love of God. Please do PVE only cards. Um, I'd also love to see heightened power levels that are PVE only things. Like give me like a purple pitch four four. Give like give me like cool. give me like my like screw making fables sort of suck. Give me the fable that's like real good, but I like I have to earn it. Um, and it's only allowed it's only allowed in PVE. Like give me that kind of stuff. I could see that. And I think the supplemental products in the future will be PVE. When I thought about like the whole, you know, concept of them, it's like, okay, drafting core products are, you know, for draft and competitive nature, but then supplemental products seem like they don't have a specific, you know, purpose for, I can see them in the future just being for a PVE format. And yeah. if you look historically the cards in them are geared towards pve i mean james white said like the the potions and in everfest was okay towards that i feel like he hinted towards that and Ooh. also i think recently uh expansion the, slots. yeah well not the expansion slot but it was like two sets back i think it was dust till dawn they had the uh the different cards where you block then you can give your other party members members like quicken tokens or you know other tokens so it seems like that all their supplemental products have pve elements so i can definitely see in the future when they have those oh you level up now you draw a pack from just a supplemental product i, I could see that happening I and also the supplemental is all the, the the classes and everything yeah i would love to see team specific I would love to. See, I would love to see people lean in on like you know. I'd love to see LSS lean on like Team Sealed and Team you know Team whatever and have like your team gains. 
um those kinds cool. of cards that oh oh that'd be so good and i know i know that you can solve that problem with any number of heroes just any number of heroes i know that solves that problem um but whatever flavor wise flavor wise i just yeah. want i just want format specific cards because i'm not really thrilled to try around the table because it's trying to be it's trying to sit at the big boy table with bard and stuff and i'm like please just stop just let me have my <laughs> fun in upf and know that I don't want to. I don't want to break down. I don't want to break down the Bravant deck. Where the hell is that going to go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make a new Bravant deck that just has all chivalry cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Like, and we're fine. And I win. Fatigue. Yeah. One it's like so, like Bravant must have one hundred cards in his deck. Ninety nine of them must be chivalry. And then there's just one card that says Sh put all chivalries back in your deck. Um. It's just it's, it's a fatigue risk and reward. It's, you don't draw chivalry until you die, or you do and you just win, and it's Oldham. Um, <laughs> he dominates you. Yeah. So, uh, sorcery had uh, some interesting announcement recently that got people a little stirred up. I thought it was pretty funny. I'm talking about the one where they talked about all of their stakeholders and uh. Oh, forgot God. to mention the players. I thought it was hilarious. Like it, it's a little snafu. Like you know, okay, you forgot to you know put in like one thing. Uh, what was what was your take on the whole thing? I'll give you a clean segue here for this. So, okay, one of the things I love about Flesh and Blood, as much as I've given it some crap from time to time, is that it's a company that's very clearly focused on players and the player experience. It's why I think that they have survived. Throughout the, that's I don't. That's why I think that market videos are a joke for Fab because they don't mean anything in the grand scheme of anything. And we've already seen this as, as product can tank and go below, and players are still like, I want to play the living crap out of this, and it's even better with the brilliance that is Bright Lights' construction. Mm -hmm. mm, talk about a brilliant construction that serves so many good purposes, uh, even more than I think the community has wrapped their mind around. Um, Ooh, foreshadow. It's yeah. Well, because I want to talk about it because I think it's real important. However, player focused and players work. Sorcery is a game that I hate so much. I hate so much. Uh, well, tell I me how it, you really feel. I think it is the worst TCG product on the market, even worse than MetaZoo. How is that even possible? I, I'd love to debate that one. Um. Here's the thing. All right, so MetaZoo is a garbage company, but mm -hmm. the product itself at least has something in place that tries to make it successful as a TCG. The game sucks, but it at least yeah. tries. It at least has like regular releases. It at least has, uh, you know, there's 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 fun variety in how the cards work. There was an attempt at organized play, and there was an attempt at, at trying to keep trying sort of to get people to actually play the game sorcery does not care about any of this sorcery is like a one set a year thing it, it makes the other thing about metazoo is at least under it at least makes sense as a tcg it at least makes as a I product it at least makes sense in a in a booster pack where sorcery does not where sorcery is 400 cards that i can't get a play set of anything if i buy box i can't get like i have to my barrier to entry is so expensive if i try to get a box Metazoo's barrier to entry is very low. <laughs> Cards are really cheap. Yeah, um, and I, that's gonna ha that's gonna happen with sorcery as well. But at least like I can look at a set, I can look at how the game was structured, I can look at I can look at how Metazoo tried to create itself and be like, I understand why you're a TCG. I understand how you exist in things like sealed and, and draft and limited formats. Where sorcery had to make it up on the fly, and it's rough and it screws over half their rules. Um, and just the, the design of the product itself, it I don't know why this is a trading card game. This should be That's a... That's actually out a of the really box. fair point. It should be a living... Like, if you want me to appreciate the artwork, why are you making it so hard for me to get it? If that that's your selling point, why are you making this so hard for me to get it? Make this an You LCD. need to have the collectible game pieces, right? Yeah, but collectible game pieces are there for the money and for the lulls. And I know that... I know you would not nearly get $4 million on a Kickstarter if this was an LCG. Um... But it feels like Sorcery is a curation project that figured out its delivery method after the fact. And it, isn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. 
it just it just it doesn't work in my brain and it doesn't work because the company also does not seem to care they have been very non-communicative which has allowed their community to do whatever the heck they want this has been the metazoo problem for a while where the community made it whatever the heck they were they wanted it to be this is why flesh and blood has gotten so much criticism in the early days late 2020 early 2021 because we didn't get a lot of communication from lss and it was just a lot of money 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 so everybody just thought it was money so in comes sorcery with a little post that talks about the allocation and the numbers of their beta print run for their uh, their Kickstarter product. So this is the go to market, not your investor thing. Mm -hmm. We've clearly heard, we very clearly heard feedback from the community on members, rarity, and availability. So uh, our numbers, rarity, and availability. So how much did you print? You know how rare things are as a result of that. The availability of product. There you go. It's also clear that no two people are aligned. Okay, uh, we see differences of opinion according to. <clears throat> We see differences of opinion. I'll do the count of how many. According to people's stake in the project and their role, collector, investor, store owner, partner, and even us as a company, we need to make even money Even us. <laughs> and even us as a company, we need to make money too. And that's fine. Okay. That part's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no players. Players is not that list. edit? Did they uh, edit it? Did they edit it after the fact? Like, I'm not in on. that server. I don't want to see it. I oh, doubt. Okay. I doubt anybody called that out. I'm not there. I don't want to see it. <laughs> um, collector, investor, store owner, partner, and you can probably make an argument that store owner is your player's angle, but that's you know whatever. Fewer characters. I think I win. Um, so when we I mean, uh, this... from the face of it though, it's it's just hilarious to me that they forgot the players. There eh, is an easy snafu. I I personally don't dig into it, but. From the points that you made earlier, you actually made me think a little bit there, because you're right. Like, MetaZoo, for sure, like, the gameplay is just non-existent. Like, it's, it's just a terrible game. It's, 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 uh, gameplay is existent, it's just bad. And Sorcery it's has gameplay bad. that I'm sure is good, I'm sure is fine. Yes. But it's how but, do I get into the product as a player. Yeah, and if you look at, though, the business model and what they're doing, MetaZoo, you're right, to their credit, they are pumping out products pretty timely, yeah. and they have a release schedule that's like two to three boxes every year, or around three boxes every year. Yeah. They have their lead times and everything like that, and they they are running organized play events when yeah. they had the They had actually... the Casper Society that did a lot of organized play things. They've recently... Yeah. And Sorcery has also partnered with Cardio, um, which is a company that that's handles good. a lot of kind of back-end processes for everybody. That's C-A-R-D-E dot I-O, because Cardio is owned by HubSpot, so they can't legally use that, so they added an E. Um, anyway. Smart. Um, so, yeah, so, like, MetaZoo had that framework in place, and Sorcery has really, it looks like they just made it up as they go along. And there's an argument against it where, and this has been, this has been the argument that has led to the hilarity in the last couple of weeks, or in the last couple of days even, which is that Alpha was never intended for players. I'm going to go with okay. This is not sorcery saying that. This is the Who said that? This is the community saying that. Okay. Which is already countered by the fact that there was a local game store tier. Um so, yeah, so I'm struggling a little bit. But they also didn't put UPCs on the booster packs so like making it hard to inventory. Um but anyway, so that reminds me real quick about this quote I read. It was I think on a Ben trading card video where he's like, This MetaZoo playmat is really bad. It's like really foamy and stuff. And someone literally commented and said, Oh that that playmat's not really been made to play with. It's more of a collector's item. And I just... <laughs> anyway Keep, keep your thought. It, it's that same type of like, oh, the playmat. You shouldn't play with that. You should. And that was like their first playmat. Anyway. So if you're if you're not, if you're not making a game for players, then you're not making a game. You're making a collectible. Yeah. The end. The ends. And I, I here's the thing is I don't think that sorcery is a I don't think that sorcery is a scam. I don't. I don't think that this was intentional. I do feel like their vision has not been communicated, and it's essentially been taken over by their community. Um, very fair they, point. And I, I, cause I really don't want to be like, I feel like they are intentionally doing this with the hope that they're just going to make their money and take their money and run. I don't think that's the case. I just don't see, I don't see how they built their business in such a way that lets things succeed, that lets this product succeed in the business it belongs in. And that's yep. why I don't know why Sorcery is a TCG because they did nothing. 
All jokes aside, that, yes, exactly. Yeah, there's there was no organized. There's no there's barely talk. There was no talk of organized play. It was supposed to be the kitchen table TCG, which that's not a thing. Um, like who care? Like who cares to have a TCG that I play with at home? Like with not friends, with no community. <laughs> like they just missed that the backbone of TCGs are community. They just ignored that and said like, no, nah, uh, let's just skip that part. Wow. But I don't think any TCG can survive with a one set a year type release schedule. It's just not possible. The, the amount of scale that you have to have to sustain your business operations with one set of year a year just doesn't work. And you know when you think about all the overhead of the people you're paying, the artists, the you know all the different you know expenses that you have that are an annualized expense that you're paying every year a fixed amount. You know, you can't do it with just one set a year. And I think the community right now of sorcery is interesting. It reminds me a lot of Flesh and Bl about Flesh and Blood back in the day where, you know, Monarch was coming out and you had so many people bitch and say, oh, there's not enough cards for the players to play. There's not enough cards to play the game. I'm a You're player. But then Monarch come out comes out, right? And then... <laughs> You, just, you never heard that anymore. You're like, oh, they overprinted. There's yeah. too many cards. You know, they, they screwed up. And it's like, right now you have that with Sorcery. It's like, if they're printing, like, let's say 50,000 boxes, that kind of sounds like enough to me. Like, Yeah, I, I think it's fine. Here's here's the thing that they missed that they haven't, that nobody has talked about. And this has been the flesh and blood problem that also <laughs> nobody has talked about, which is how we get into there's not enough cards and now there's too many cards. And that's mm -hmm. the concept of product churn. How do I create product churn? How do I have a store that buys a case of product? And then how does that case go away and get them to Draft. buy the product? And then how do I get that case to go away? And yeah, price support is one of the most common ones. Like that's the thing that I think sorcery missed real hard. That's the thing that most games miss real hard is the product churn aspect of it. Because like my community is not buying direct from me. Like once sorcery alpha is out, they're not buying from Sor Eric's Curiosa again. Direct. That's not a thing. It's not a thing. Um, so what well, the hell first is, they what need the to even guys... prove like, mm. that they can go into a store, right? Like you're talking about products turn. They're not. They're they're currently a business to customer relationship. I mean, they're so, starting I mean, up their B two B now. Kickstarter... Aren't they doing that now? Yeah. So Kickstarter yeah. is B two C. Kickstarter is yeah. business to customer by its nature. Yep. Then you need to switch over to B two B. Then you need to switch. And over they're doing to that now, right? Yeah. 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 And they, I mean, they got there. That was like always their plan was to get there at some point. So it's, again, it's not like they were screwing up. But that's, again, that's the, that's the relationship that people don't wrap their minds around. It's like, hey, I got this product that went to 700 bucks because you sent it to me directly and there was no middleman. Now there needs to be a middleman. And I need to convince them that the product is actually going to sell from the shelf. And MetaZoo tried it where it's going to sell from the shelf because people are going to turn around and make it $300. And that's why they instilled that MSRP demand from LGSs that went over real well. Um, and then by set four, everyone in MetaZoo was like, these guys have an alpha. I'm going to go give them money. Um, and they couldn't churn product anymore. And Distro is just holding on to it. It's like, I don't really want to make an order with you for this because nobody's buying it. Because stores aren't rebuying it. And they're not making orders. Nobody's reordering. I don't, I don't want your stuff, dude. Well, because all the free tendies are in the alpha product. So then after yeah. that, it's like, it's weird how the alpha product goes to the customers directly. And that's where the most, uh, you know, the money's made. But then afterwards, it's like, oh, okay, you know, LGSs get sloppy seconds, which is interesting. Yeah. Like, but I, I, I don't want to be... set three and four work. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. again, I'm going back to Sorcery. because like, Sorcery, you built on, you built on the nostalgic and beautiful artwork of people who are a lot older than those people who are going into game stores most of the time. And if they are, they're pretty committed to Commander. Um, but what do you do? Well, uh, you know, we've, we've set our opinions with, uh, you know, our nitpicking, but if right now I'm, I'm Eric, you're, you're giving me a pitch. What do you do? And I'll say mine afterwards. Like what, so how, how do you do steer I, the ship in the how do I, right direction? How do I solve the problem? How do I solve the problem of the game? Or yeah. What I... do you do with a print run of beta? How many set releases do you have a year? Like what, what, what's your vision of how they could be successful in the future? Let's see if I can come up with this without trying to change the product format too, too much. Okay, I, I, I can give mine if you want first. Give yours. I'm going I'm to see if I can do okay. it without changing one set a year. But I'm going to add releases. But I want to see if I can pull it off without changing one set a year. I'm going to do the same thing as you. Okay, okay. one set a year. <laughs> I'm <laughs> Eric. I'm Eric. All right, you're Eric. For the current 
beta print run, I keep it at 50,000. And then I reprint cards as necessary, but when I reprint them, I will change the artwork. So it's not the same artwork, it's a different artwork. But the way I pitched this to Eric is I was like, hey, Eric, you are a brilliant man. You made a art platform that circles around a trading card game. You have created a, a system where artists can onboard onto your project. And what you need to do with this is you need to utilize the platform you've created and make a lot better art contracts with your artists. <laughs> yeah, own you need your stuff. To own your freaking IP, <laughs> first off. You need to get a percentage base of income from the art sales of what art that is being produced for your company. I, and when you do that, I would partner with Mike, you know, Collector's Mike Art Gordon. House, and have all the art just siphoned to him, and you guys get, like, a certain percentage of the profits, and then the artists do. So that's a continual revenue stream. And when you do that, I would have it varied throughout the year. So you have our auctions at various points in the year to just, you know, keep your hype cycle up. But yeah, one product a year, you'd have new artists that are less expensive than the ones that you've been contracted currently. You'd do a lot better agreements with them because literally you say, hey, the artwork that you make now, you're going to sell it for $500. Mm -hmm. You become part of our TCG platform and you can sell that same art piece for $2,500. And then you split the profits. So that's, I think, how you supplement the lack of another set per year. You create a revenue source out of an, a typical expense source for your business. Okay. That's that's how I think I would you know pitch it to them. That's what I think it needs to do is basically you lean really hard into an art platform. Like this is a TCG, a gaming experience, and you don't focus on the competitive nature. This isn't a competitive game. Don't be like MetaZoo where MetaZoo's like, we are everything. Yeah, no, you're not. <laughs> we, we we are legion. You know, focus on the casual experience. Focus on organized play, but be more, you know, you can have competitions, but be more about just, you know, having fun playing playing games and stuff like that and focus more on the art procurement and, and get better contracts, man. Like, you need to own your IP when you do it and you need to, you know, get a cut of the revenue, I think. Anyway. I don't like that. All right. Um, just to respect, I respect the time, 30 on the clock. <clears throat> 30 on the clock. Not for this answer. Just for the rest of it, everybody. Yep. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So I'm Eric. I'm Eric. First thing I do, um, and we'll do, again, we'll do this without changing the, we'll do this without changing the booster box, but I'm going to add the product line. Because um, I still need to turn product. I add specific pack, I, sp I add a specific product that is designed for uh, adding to the organized play experience. Uh, it's not quite a PVE type of thing, but maybe it is maybe some kind of thing that maybe like changes the board. Um, maybe it is something that lets me do like sealed, but already kind of sets up my sets up my uh, my world a little bit. Like if you know the sorcery game, hmm. you kind of build the world. It's you are, oh, you, yeah. are you are avatars that are fighting to build the world in your in your image, um, which is really cool. Um, but if you're going to play into, you know, one of the things that makes sorcery great is that it's narrative. It's a narrative experience. You are creating a story as you go. I would write stories that are supplemented by cards that enhance that experience. Um, and in doing so, you can create a format that maybe does lend itself to like a sealed format a little bit, where I'm not like reliant on getting enough lands. I put, I've, I've put land in this little pack, in this little kit, in this little thing. And mm -hmm. I really, really, I really, I... I release a story every quarter or a part to the story every quarter, which is a, which is a reason to get people in like maybe once a month. Cause I don't want to do weekly that, that eliminates the whole kitchen table thing. Right. That's not the point. But maybe like once a month, um, or like once a do quarter. Do like an I'll, L5R thing or? Yeah. Maybe something like that. Like I'll do, it's, it's kind of like a living legend or not living legend. It's like, like, like a living card game kind of blend. But it's just with the world itself, and maybe like an avatar here or there that inspires me to chain, you know, to play around with different deck ideas, but to walk through a story that is happening. And then, like, once a month, a store can, you know, like host a really cool event. And then for prize support, randomize it. Like, that's where I print my foils. Like, that's where I print my, my cool foils. That's where I do, like, my little thing, you know, my, my really cool, my great artist stuff. That's where I bring out, like, the Frank Frenzettas again. Um, 
I do it that way to encourage people to actually go out and try to play. But again, it's real casual and real simple. Um, I would do that to try to encourage people to come in the store. That might also help churn product because you can use the product to you know, kind of enhance those decks. You do it in a way that is really not asking for a lot of time. You add something extra to it that is not competitive, which in this case is follow along with the story. And you offer something that is really special for that collector and that artist group to be like, I want to do this because I want to earn that thing. That would be really cool to have in my collection. That's what I would tell Eric to do with his product. And do you randomize the product uh, prize support? So like, you don't know if you're going to get like a really big card and it's like randomized in some way? I'm not quite way. sure. How, I don't know how I feel about that purchase yet. Because we tried this with Genesis and it was really bad. Oh, really? Um, if you're going to go once, because with Genesis, the, the once a month thing was not by desire. It was by all, that's all that could fire. Uh, mm -hmm. So when we had rare cards with the hope that people would show up every week, it was, and you know, it'd be a lot easier to acquire. But when you're doing it once a month, I've got a community of eight people. I've only got like one spicy card and you only do things once a month that people will just give up at that point. So I don't think yeah. I, I don't think I do that. I'm not. What do you put with beta print run too? Do you give in to the masses and print like a hundred thousand or do you keep it at 50? Keep it at 50. Like the thing is, is so you're, you're little, you're, you're little, like we print it and then like we have different art that's revised by the way, that is the revised that is the product already been decided which is revised because they're yep. trying to be fucking magic and they are they have... doing that actually huh no I'm not are they going to make like a white bordered revised and sorcery i, I, I could see them doing, doing that. i don't think they're doing a white bordered i don't think they're doing white bordered because they well they don't have borders none of them don't, have, uh, their cards don't have borders yeah you're right one sec i do so you don't think you do a white border i wouldn't do a white border do you put a trademark on your card? You you make it a okay on the back. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you're right. You you do what they did there, and you 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 put a oh actually shoot you can't put an R. Um, because you can do an al you can do an alpha you can do a beta you can't you can't put an R in a circle because that's uh, that's rights registered. Um, they'll come up with something to make it revised. <laughs> they built the product with that intention, which pisses me off it's so maybe dumb. they maybe they add a border and everything now is full art there, there you go everything now is full art Every, yeah there you I go i don't know uh but best wishes the game i mean it'll be interesting to see how the cycle you know progresses with that because right now i don't know about you but i'm it's like watching the same movie for like the third time with that game it's just like you know rudy hype gets tons of people in and then everyone's clamoring for the cards they print a ton based off of community and then uh card prices go down community bitches that there's you know overprinting, and it's like well wait you, you told me to print more it's like what what's going on here um here's the thing all right so here's the thing about sorcery that i'm going to admit was actually really enlightening so um so mike from collector art house he is not for anybody who doesn't know he is not a member of the company but he, awesome guy uh yeah um he basically took advantage of the fact that eric's curiosa owns that much of their artwork and said how about i art house syndicate this thing but take it a step further and to, to mike's credit he took it in steps that i wish art house syndicate would do um because he really got the artists into the community he really made yeah. them a part of that project he really should have been on staff um he, he made absolutely... household names right huh? household names about oh. people like new artists like he was like oh this is a new and upcoming artist here's what they're all about and if you go on his website like basically it shows like the card art and then it explains what the artist was thinking when they did yeah. that art he, he, it's he beautiful how he did that he had those interviews with artists and he did like booster box openings with artists he did interviews with them like he got them into he got them into the community Honestly, also Fab should do this as well. Of like, it's not, hey, we showed up to an event because we were close by. It's like, oh, give me, like, I want to, I want to hear your thought process for Library of Solana. Like, I want to, mm, that, I want to see, I want to, I want to know what, what was the creative brief and where did you take that? Mm. So that's what Mike did from Collector Art House. I, yeah. me and him, we started off on not great ground because I really thought that he was just kind of like scamming and overtaking something. And then I realized that. Eric, the curiosity just left it there. Who wouldn't 
who wouldn't with the names that that sorcery has? Like, there's a lot of money to be made. Um, so him and I are cool now, and I actually think I actually think he's a phenomenal guy. So to the credit of of sorcery's community, um, there's a lot sharp. There are a lot more sharper people in that community than I gave it credit for. Even when I kind of when I put them on blast a little bit, I'm in that same like Kickstarter. Like, oh, I don't know anything, but I know this is money. Um, <laughs> And I'm like, oh, I hate your guts. Um, but in talking to him, I did a podcast with him a couple weeks ago and following up with this community where I started talking about things like product churn and why why does a store buy this if they've never heard of it? Um, and like opening those questions, they really started like listening, like how do we kind of solve some of these problems? And I was like, shit. I was just excited to walk away and be mad at you. But actually you guys are... You guys are actually suckered crazy. me back in. I know. Like, yeah. why? Why can't you guys just like not listen and just post? Why can't you tell me to f off and delete me from the server? Yeah. Um. No. So yeah, no. Like they were, you know, that's the thing that I I've been liking, especially as I've I've done done more talks with this, like with Riddler and like you know even with you here of let's get mm -hmm. smarter, and I find a lot more people are interested in being smarter at this because they want to see stuff grow. It doesn't mean shit for subs. Um, but like, they, <laughs> but they want to be smarter at it. So I can rip on sorcery like crazy because I think that they're, they do not make sense as a product. They don't make sense as a TCG and they have not shared any actual coherent vision that makes sense. And they've just, they've just let their community take this thing over and that blows and that blows in this industry right now. But there are I know, I very, agree with most of that. There are some very clear, like, kind of people who have really become massive in the community itself that do recognize the problems that Sorcery has and want to see it go forward and are bringing up those questions. The day after I had that podcast with Mike, and I'm not, I'm not going to fluke this thing and say, oh, they did it because of me. Um, the day after, though, as a lot of conversations were happening... Sorcery also announced their uh, a partnership with Cardio to do store locators and and, to, and have a place for people to put the events out, you know, put to put where they have events out. So it could cool. be, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. It would be nice to see them have a clear cut vision in the future, and I firmly believe, like you know, talking about Mike, I think he found the business model that makes that game work long term. It's all about the contracting the artwork and owning your ip and, and getting a cut out of the, you know the artist platform but you know going into flesh and blood uh another topic i really yeah, we should wanted probably to end on to, like flesh and blood because yeah let's end on flesh <laughs> and blood what what do you think about these new reprints so if i can like start it off so recently there's been a number of reprints like we saw today actually the cold foil art of war <laughs> and we saw oh um, those reprints Yes, and then the the rainbow foil uh, zero to sixty. From Maybe I should just Covenant. reset my timer here. Kidding. Um. <laughs> no, no, you, no, you I'm not. Stuff. No, I appreciate all your time tonight. No, but like the the big question is like I think from a collector's point of view, right? In 2021, Rudy made a video where he was talking to James White about history pack because people didn't understand it and they were wondering why more cards needed to be printed if all these unlimited cards were out. And James White responded to him saying, hey, like, you know how Magic does the flashy era where they keep reprinting flashier and flashier cards? Well, Flash, Flesh and Blood is the opposite of that, where we print less and less quality of cards. If you notice, we go from cold foil to rainbow foil to non-foil to now white border cards. And that whole sentiment, I think, from that video got spread around the community in the, at that time, and it felt like some sort of spirit or promise oh my god what do you think is, about are that you, is, uh, i didn't know i didn't reprints. know this i didn't know that are you, you kidding didn't know me that? is that i didn't yes. know that is that yeah, seriously their justification yes. for why that's, that's, oh. i feel that way god what okay okay let's get what do you let's... think about that i think it's a special brand of dumb that i did not realize existed um <clears throat> i'd love to hear it all right, let's just. Let's... You and I probably have a different opinion on this. So I'd love to hear your opinion. No, let's let's let's. I we can keep this one real basic, right? Okay. Yeah. Remember, remember how Magic had their flashy era, where it was like going up, and we had foils and etched and all these cool things, and you know, like, why the hell do you think older cards didn't have the flashy era? 
we didn't know the tech exists. Nobody gave a crap about foils in 93 or 94, 5 or 6. Nobody knew if that was going to be a thing that mattered. Star Wars didn't start until like 98 with 97, 98 with reflections, like for, for three, four years. The only direction they had to go was up because they started way the hell down here because nobody really, who, who spends the money to invest in foils if you don't even know if the basic concept of your t of trading card game is going to work? You have to have mm -hmm. a flashy era because you had to start down the hell here. Fab's up there with the rest of technology and we know where you have access to and we know it's popular and we know, we know those things. So yeah, you, you have to come down. It's the only direction you've got is to go down. Are you... Mm, and you have to be mad that Alpha and First Edition is is a rainbow foil. There's a cold foil of Teclo Core. Yeah, I don't care. Because somebody say No, no. Go go find me the person who's, who's bitching at the fact that Black Lotus Alpha went down in price because of M30. Because they could do it in foil. Like, shut... Oh my god, I'm so... Well, it's don't you think that there has to I be... Thought it was. Shouldn't there be some sort of semblance of <clears throat> this is how cards are reprinted? Because Magic the Gathering has the whole reserve list. Flesh and Blood, I feel like a lot of sentiment around the, the community was cards get worse over time. And once they... And they've done it in other things too, man. Like, have you seen, like, Scar for a Scar was printed in Uprising. It didn't have a rainbow foil. There's a bunch of reprints in this set. Doesn't have a rainbow foil because they were printed in other, you know... You know, sets. So the precedent seemed to be following that trajectory for a number of cards. All right. Well, you're you can't you can't conflate the two. You can't say you you cannot say that. Isn't it weird that the quality and the treatment of the card uh, is allowed to increase while also saying we don't want the cards to get worse and better over time? Like the reserve list was primarily a power level thing. Also, that's um, fair. So you can't be it was like. About you can't community. you can't complain and be like you can't complain and be like well you're not allowed to have a zero to seventy because you said the cards get worse over time, and the conversation around cards getting worse over time was simply cold foil rainbow foil, no foil white border. Those mm -hmm. are two different conversations as far as what is getting better and worse. So no, no you you don't get to complain about there's a different zero. You know you know why that zero to sixty is worse the new one the promo one because it doesn't have yellow. There you go. Oh yeah, it's just red. It's blue. The art. Oh yeah. Is blue. Well, the art is blue. The yeah. art is blue. There you go. It's 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 a misprint. It's not green like the normal zero to sixty. I'm like what's just <laughs> strange though is why didn't they just pick another card? They they made a hundred plus cards in the new set. Probably two hundred plus, right? Mm -hmm. Why didn't they just pick another common card and make an alternate art just like they did with Scar for Scar back in the day? They had the TC Scar for Scar alternate promo. That that's huge. Yeah. They could have just picked any other card, art alternate art. You know, the players would have been happy. The collectors would have been happy. It just doesn't make sense to reprint it in like rainbow foil again. It's just strange. You're right. Me. No, you're right. It doesn't. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I can at least say it doesn't really make a lot of sense, unless this was one of those. So the thing is, is so. Working with Team Covenant to try to get them on board with Genesis, which was semi-successful, but we just ran out of time. Um, one of the things that they really wanted to do, one of the things that's really big for them, is to be able to get that Team Covenant promo. Maybe, I'm really, um, oh, I'm just in the left field here. Maybe they're trying to make, maybe it was a, like, there was a set that they couldn't do with Team Covenant, or like timing didn't work out or something like that. And this is to try to catch up. And maybe like Team Covenant, maybe ha like they got to take their pick of something or... <sighs> yeah, maybe it's something maybe. like that. Like, I don't, like, maybe they went to Zach and said, what do you want? You know, what can we do? I don't know. I'm throwing a lot of stuff out there. Because, yeah, it doesn't make sense why, why you well, pick same with cards the that's not core. in the set. Yeah, the Teclo Core too. Like, you had 40 Majestics in the new set. You could have made any one of them cold foil or cold foil alternate art mm -hmm. and the players would have been happy the collectors would have been happy mm -hmm. it's just it's an interesting time that we're in right now this shift because i think the writing's on the wall where collectors understand now that welcome to wrath arcane rising crucible war well at least welcome to wrath and arcane rising they're going to be reprinted in cold foil like all those cards in judge packs or prize support or, or other things. Here? They might show up I think in that's what's being they might said. show up in the expansion slots as an opportunity. Yeah. They even said an opportunity to reprint. Like it's gonna come back. 
I'm not sold that this is a problem. I'm not sold that I, I don't, I don't care. And it's not that I don't care about collectors and I don't care about their, their, I don't, it's not that I don't care about that aspect of it. Like y'all are people too. It's, I don't see how this changes anything. I don't see how this devalues something that very clearly has the marking of arcane first, you know, arc 101 dash C. Like that's fair. Those are like, I, I, I've mentioned to you before. It's the, it's the Charizard. Charizard has been reprinted the exact same card over and over and over and over and over again. The marking of first edition makes it real clear that that's the one that's worth money. Nobody looks at a new one that comes out and said, oh, my, my other one sucks. Like my other one sucks. Now, if you have that kind of disposable income to spend on that kind of first edition stuff, who gives two shits about this little team covenant promo? Who does? Who's, who's looking at art of war right now? That's a cold foil in the judges pack and say, I was going to have a significant investment in first edition art of wars, but now that there's this cold foil out, I guess I'm just going to throw all that away and just put a position over in this thing. If you're trying to collect that set if you're trying to invest in arc first stuff because of the history and that kind of thing this doesn't change the conversation and if it does you're bad at it you shouldn't be bitching about reprints anyway because the cold foil just did you a favor shut up <laughs> i think it was just more about expectation right like nobody really thought it would all be reprinted in a bigger thing and when you think about techlo core you know versus the pokemon the charizard example like they haven't, the Pokemon company, I, from what I know, have they printed a Charizard that looks better and is more rare? Because these Techno yeah, cores are probably going to be under a thousand, whereas the original amount of Techno cores, Rainbow Foil, were probably like 1500 to 2000. I think 1500. But anyway, numerically, these new ones are going to be rare and look better. You can't do yeah. numerically. Like, numerically is never going to work because Pokemon has such a much bigger audience. So we'll do That's fair. number of cards per capita. Um, yeah. Which you do have, like, the, you know, I don't, it's definitely not the same card. It's you know, not the same function, but you have this holy crap, beautiful thing um, that says Charizard on it that's worth, you know, a ton and plenty. But again, I don't care what it is, because if I'm trying to make a, if I'm trying to make a position in the OG set, because that's the thing I think is going to increase in value, it doesn't matter that something came out in a different set. It just doesn't. Gotcha. Especially because you if think... you've got if you've got cards that are out there for players, one, nobody's saying, man, I really need an arc first, or I really need an art of war for my deck. I've got an idea. I'm gonna go buy a bunch of arc first ones. No, no, that is no, true. that's not a thing. Um, you like the, the rarity is not the rarity of arc first and crew first and alpha are not gonna come from players that are just trying to deck their you are trying to like bling out their their decks they're from people who have the disposable income to appreciate the history and are trying to collect that history and take a position in it nothing new matters i don't care if it's cold foil i don't care if it's rainbow foil remember here here's the proof remember when <clears throat> um remember what made um uh, crucible's tunic so freaking spicy that everyone's like uh... oh my god cru the crucible tunic oh man you won't believe this, and it it's it shot up in price. Why? The the total quantity from the print run and nope. How much it was printed? No, nope. I don't know. This I is forgot. the only legendary that is not foil. <laughs> that was the, that? that was that was the story. That is at the, stupid. At the time, that was it was the only legendary that wasn't foil, and that was like the big thing. Um. And that's what's well, that's okay. a I, word for the wise of not like investing with like you know random news like that or oddities like those things never pan out good long term yeah like i don't i don't see i don't care at the end of the day you want acts you want more people to get the game because you don't want those numbers reduced you want the number per capita reduced you want the percentage of cards in people's hands to you know or you want the percentage of people that have those cards to be significantly small black lotus is not incredibly rare in the you know, in the way that it is because the print number was so small it's rare because the print number was it was what it was and a majority of people didn't give a shit and what's left mm. that's good as a percentage of it versus people in the game is misferred. that's where your money comes from it doesn't matter yeah yeah it'll probably be fine overall and mm -hmm. the game of flesh and blood is expanding i mean it does feel like the market keeps growing and growing and from such, I think, you know, it, it's all going to be fine. But yeah. In the interim, like, I feel like 
there is a perception change that needs to occur from 2021 to now. Like, I feel the, there's a lot of collectors that I've spoken to, you know, in the last week or month where they didn't, you know, enjoy seeing like certain reprints. And the whole question is like, why not print it in another card? Like, why choose this old stuff? But from the direction of this game, it definitely seems like these cards are being reprinted zero, in zero some to sixty is in round the table. It's in round the table. But it's not rainbow foil. Ooh. And like at that point, what are you collecting? What are you what collecting? You I, I guess the cold foils are, are the only like safe thing. And I guess the team covenant is like a neon foil. It's a different type of foil, but I, I feel like it's, it's I just, don't know if it's a different treatment. I don't. It looks different. It's like purple instead of green. I think that's because there's no yellow. Like Maybe the that's card it. doesn't have yellow, which means it's going to reflect differently. It's just like foil reflecting off of my yellow surface versus ref foil side by side with like black. It's going to oh, reflect a lot fair. more. So you're going to have that contrast. Your eye is going to see a lot more contrast next to black as opposed to yellow. That's like this middle, this mid-tone thing. <laughs> um, I'll have to hold one in my hand and see, like, you know, side by side. Yeah, I don't here, think it's but, a different treatment, though. Yeah. And at the end of the day, what do you, if that is your concern, what exactly are you collecting? Be what are you taking a position in? Are you taking a position in zero to 60s? Really, that's going to be the hill you want to die on? Are you taking a position in arc first, which at this point, this promo doesn't mean shit? Are you taking a well, position in rainbow position foil? Because they got news for you. I'll send you like 70 rainbow foils, zero to 60, because nobody gives a shit. <laughs> I, I feel like it's the position is more of a mindset you know man like it's like we feel like these th things were promised but it's different but yeah you know, and again I, if, I if we'll that's the context of we are the if james is saying it's going to go down from cold to rainbow to, to black border white border and you're saying i don't like that zero to 60 was reprinted because i think with zero to 50 out there why are you reprinting cards that good that's two separate conversations and at that point that gets me into that dark twisted way that says you really just want to power nine so you have something to laud over people you really want cnc to never be reprinted anymore ever again so that way 10 years down the road you can whip out a cnc and say i have access to this card and you you don't you suck oh no it it's like a if power, power nine issue. was never banned yeah yeah but it's not a power creep like i think if zero to 60 was reprinted again in just normal no foil nobody cares you know it's when you use the same treatment and it you know got reprinted in the same foiling from three years ago remember but... how no oh remember the big batch of nobody gives a shit that foreign markets with history pack got marvels of heroes and we didn't <laughs> No, 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 nobody, nobody cared. Nobody gave a shit. Remember, remember the, the yeah. week and a half that people really gave a shit that um, the Japan printing didn't have the um, the art sketches in Dust Till Dawn? Like, that was a pretty big thing. You know how many people care about the art sketches? Well, they haven't even all been pulled. Nobody cares. They they don't. Um, just not an execution. I get You can feel bad, but like, in the grand scheme of the bigger, like, the bigger picture has just been, let's put it this way. The community of flesh and blood There's has a been big built picture. so strongly around growth that these petty, sad little grievances are cute for a half hour. And then everyone goes back and looks at the game and the community and how they're enjoying it and saying, you know what? This is a lot more fun. No, oh, yeah. This is why I think no, Bright, I this is why Bright Lights is just brilliant. Oh my god, what a wonderful little product. What a It is a great product. Um and I've I've I shot Brian a message it's like I've loved outsiders, I've loved bright lights. And bright lights gets to do something that no other set can do. And I don't think people realize unless you took a good look. I'm going to we're going to do some extra time. I always do extra time. That's another Dex and Drafts specialty by the way. I add myself extra time. I'm going to add I want to be respectful of your time. But uh, to, oh, to close the door on that um, that if, previous convo yeah, though, if you, real quick though. Like yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. Like if you look at this thing and say, "Well, I'm selling all my flesh and blood cards. I'm out of the game." Like you're ridiculous. Like mm -hmm. this is a very small microcosm conversation, important that it might be, but overall if you look at the big picture, games doing great. Especially with the new set, Bright Lights. I mean, Bright Lights is just a banger of a product doing great stuff. But what are you telling me that is hidden in Bright Lights that I haven't seen? Yeah, I, I don't know what the problem is. Like, are you worried about the value of your collection? Because at that point, you're not a collector, you're a dealer, you're an investor. 
Are you worried? No. Be- are you worried because you don't feel like you're going to have something in full? Go get it from Team Covenant then. It's not that hard. It's like understanding chaos and understanding, okay, what is collectible, what's not, and like what promises were made to the reprints and are they substantiated by that? Mm-hmm. But the thing is, in this case, James White never said this. LSS never said that. It was all hearsay from Rudy. And that that's where I think people are like, yeah. not understanding where the information came from and if we should really hold that promise to such a degree you know no, what i mean i, like, I mean i honestly wouldn't mind if he doubled it, it back shouldn't. on it the only thing that i hope he never doubles back is on the cold yeah. foils because we've got so much in that have been on the cold foils that said i have no problem if he jumps in and says hey we have this new treatment that's even rarer than a cold foil that we want to try out which is destined to happen um like it's going to and i'd be fine with that I'd, I'd be fine Probably. to have you. Know, I mean, well, actually, all things considered, we do have that. They're called gold foils. Um, <laughs> like we have this. Uh, we have this in gold foil form. Um, nobody bats an eye. Nobody has a problem with it. Well, it's because it was that said. So that's another precedent of okay, gold foils exist, and you know, they're for the pro players. I don't want to make you too too. Late. I want to finish. I want to. I want to end on bright lights and talk about just how wonderful it is. I really want to end this on a good note, as opposed to I like that new community. <laughs> <laughs> but also to like the four of you who are really mad about this fuck you Dex, I'm one. dexandrafts at gmail.com feel free to send your pitchforks and torches in my direction because y'all are losing your mind over nothing that has been one done over and over and over again that has been seen multiple times across multiple cards in flesh and blood and you guys didn't bat an eye um, just like with the Art of War cold foil things that people got up in arms about, and in the back of my mind, and how about let's let's do some let's do some Chad cast bullshit here. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize because you don't have to you don't have access to cards that you actually have to work to get, as opposed to just being able to buy it off of somebody. You can still buy it off of people. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, but fewer people are going to do that with the judges packs. Like if I get like a cold foil Art of War or stuff like that, like. It, Think people will keep it? I think either some will, or I think the I think the fact that there's less dis- there's potentially less distribution of it. Um, I think that's going to be. I think you're going to see either rare. Or it's going to be hard. It might be harder to get. It might be something that's like traded more locally. It's not going to be like going to a battle hardened, and I know who got those cards because I can see who the top eight is, so I can go bug them and wait for them to show up. You know, show up on marketplace. Um, I don't think it's that. Um, and I like the judges. I like the judges foils. I love those things. But there was a little like I, I, I feel like people need to play for their heroes. Cold foil that I got into it with somebody on Twitter. I'm like, I don't. I didn't get to play for Azalea. Half the people are like, Hey, I won this cold foil Oldham at, at Pro Tour, and fucking, I don't want this thing, so I'm gonna get rid of it. So like, there's no sentimentality to me playing for my hero when I'm not playing for my hero. I'm playing for one that I got. Like, it's, yeah. just, it's a lot of just excuses to make new things that LSS is doing to give unique, fun, interesting cards with just that awesome treatment to more people who contribute in greater ways to the community. And it's this disposable income, $300 a card group that are going to find anything they can to be like, I'm the one with the money. Why am I not more important? Fuck you all. <laughs> I am not sorry. <laughs> I mean, Dex and Draft, I don't like this. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of in, intrigued. I hope the prices of Rainbow Foil, like Alpha and Arc, go down so I can buy some. Mm-hmm. I still haven't bought in those cards because you know they're, they're too high price mm-hmm. for you know my budget. But yeah. ultimately, honestly, man, I don't think it's a lot of people caring about mm-hmm. the cards they own and the prices. It's more of just a mindset of okay, there's chaos in reprints. Yeah. You don't know what they're going to reprint. You don't know what's going to happen. I want a guarantee from a company, like, this is how we're going to reprint it. You know, we won't reprint it doing certain things going forward. And, and I, I think that... I don't. Maybe, yeah. maybe you know... You don't think people? You're asking, people for, you're asking money. for a reserve list. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not asking for a reserve list. A reserve list for... concept. I can add, yes, I can add, I will never yes. give this card this treatment again. Yes. That's So essentially they, they you're asking that. for a reserve list. They had that for cold foils now, but yes. only when it's in a booster box. Yes, uh, which they've said it otherwise. And again, I go back right to the marketing of the card. I go, I go right back to the Charizard argument of if you're collecting history and you really want alpha and you need to know that it's alpha, it's pretty clear. You're not confusing anybody. LSS isn't confusing That's anybody. Fair point. 
that's all I've got. If you if you really like the you know if you want the pride of ownership and having a cold foil tunic, which I think is a good one. Like I've got a cold foil Skeletta of, of all the ones I have. It's a fucking Skeletta. Um, <laughs> and I, there's a pride of ownership that I have in owning something like that. And it would be really sad if they if I saw that again. I'm like, oh man, mine just mine doesn't feel as good anymore because everybody's kind of got one. That's fine. But if you're gonna add to it. I'm mad at this because I saw it from Rudy, who really doesn't care about your feelings if it's not money related. Um, or you're going to come in and be like, you're devaluing my collection. No, you're not. Who's... Did you have a sale that just got disrupted as a result of, like, stop. That's not collecting. That's dealing. That's worrying about your dealing value. And I don't care. I just don't. Fair points. I, I agree to disagree, but I, I love your, uh, you know, take on the whole matter. <laughs> But bright lights. Let's end it on a good note, and yes, not too it, far past your drop dead time. End it on a good note for sure. Um, I fucking love this. I got wall. I got walled O three in my pre release. I went dash. I, I went dash because I kind of. So I, it was a seal. I went dash. You boost a lot. <sighs> Sealed's real swingy. Um, it's real swingy. Um, I boosted enough, but I couldn't get. I didn't really have a lot of items, but at the end of the day, like everything was like close. Everything was mm -hmm. real close. Um, I love there was like I had to think this set. Like the thing that I, the way that I've been sharing my feelings with bright lights is bright lights. I have to like same with outsiders. I have to earn my victory. I don't just draw it, which is the tales of Aria problem. I can just draw a victory in tales of Aria. Um, you have to earn your victory in bright lights and i love that i loved watching everybody at we had like 24 like 24 person pre-release and everyone was just like i i don't just have i don't know exactly what my win condition is but i know i'm gonna have to figure it the fuck out because i'm getting hit for 10 all of a sudden with overpower Whoa. <laughs> it was like, everybody had fun learning all the different nuances of everything that was coming at them and there were different lines of play as a result of it. Like, it mattered what I got rid of because there was no one more powerful card than the other. It was just the same card, but, like, a different effect. Oh, I mm. love Bright Lights. Oh, I love Bright did Lights. You, did you feel that the cards were easily understood for new players? Like, did you play against any new players? Because one big criticism I had about Monarch is I saw a bunch of new players were like, I don't know what any of this stuff does, you know? So because... Here's 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 the comparison. So one, I did play against somebody who was new and brand spanking new. It was his first event. Um Perfect. and I did what I always do and like unload him with cards. Um but he also won the raffle for the round the table. They gave away two. He won the raffle for the, oh. the second one. I was like, yes. Um he loved the crap out of the game. Hilariously, the reason he won he loved the crap out of it, and shout out to Gorganian, because he was like, Man, this is like playing Street Fighter. Like, oh, I got something yep. to show you. Um he was able to wrap his mind around the core mechanics a heck of a lot better. I think where, Bla where Bright Light struggles is, even where I struggled, of, like, there's so many things, and this is this is just training your brain to having a board state now in this game, is there's so many mm -hmm. things going on that, like, I didn't realize, like, oh, man, I didn't have to pay for all of this. or Like, those little things are kind of, like, slight feel-bad moments, but he never had a problem with the basic mechanics that allowed him to move forward. That was Monarch's problem is to move forward with chain you've got so many other things to think about that are very different than what the actual game is asking you to do yeah that sucks that made that made monarch real hard but no he loved the living crap out of it he also got himself fairly walloped um but he, he ended up beat he beat me on a head on a barn burner um but yeah no he he i, I think that's the nice thing about bright lights is the core mechanics are are so important Everything on the board can get in the way and make things a little confusing, but really that's just some kind of feel-bad moments of, oh, shoot, I didn't need to pitch this much, or I could have played this, as opposed mm -hmm. to, I don't, know what I, I don't know what I can do. That Monarch was, I don't know what I can do. Bright Lights is not that. And I think that's great. That's great to hear. Yeah, and I, I didn't get to go out to, this is, I think, the first pre-release I missed in, like, the last two years, which sucks, especially with such a great draftable set. But I was talking to my buddy Tom at uh, Locals, and he was telling me something pretty fascinating that he was thinking with Draft, the borders for all the Mechanologist cards are, like, a little bit different. Like, there's three different main borders, 
And he was saying if you're drafting completely new, you probably want to get like all of a symbol, a similar type of border. Yeah, I feel like because an those. I feel like they're split. Yeah, by exactly. Or who, who like there's a the hero they're a little bit hidden for. Exactly, and if you get more of those, then you have more synergies in the cards technically. So if you're even if you're really new and you don't know what the cards do, One you day. can at least look for those things. But. Yeah, Thanks, and I, uh, I like that. I like that. I, I need to crack some packs in order to see it. But no, I love it. I also love, and the, anybody who saw Essen, the Essen article, will see this immediately, how much crack shuffle play there is in there. Flesh and Blood has mm -hmm. finally created a... Pro with them talking about convention program management, Flesh and Blood has finally created a product that you can get the full product experience for and learn the game at a convention in minutes. Holy shit. That's real cool. That's ba it's basically their version of Jumpstart, but much much better because there's there's a lot more variance and it's really interesting. Yep. Oh, I love this. And set. no mana screw. And it's and I'm excited to build things with it. Like I walked away from Bright Lights being like, I cannot wait to see this in Data Doll, and I cannot wait to make Dash work. That's the thing that I'm most excited for. So I'm gonna end with good fucking job, Brian, and good job where Flesh and Blood is headed. Go have fun, finally. Go have fun with this game because they're making it fun. It's a great damn game. Thanks, Joey. Appreciate your time, man. Yeah, for sure. Cheers.